you know, to bring uh, that next generation in, whether it's one person or two persons, uh, sometimes you need to uh, grow the sales of the business, grow the revenue to be able to support them. And that may involve uh, going out and uh, securing some capital. So today we have uh, John Lair, who's a uh, consultant with Farm Credit East, uh, to discuss that with us. Uh, John's had a uh, long career with uh, Farm Credit, both in the lending and uh, consulting side. He started his career uh, in southern New England uh, and as a loan officer and now works out of the Sager Field office. Morning. Can everybody hear me? Um, I'm going to take a little different spin on the financing. You can see I put it in parentheses. I'm going to touch on the capital piece just a tiny bit on uh, a few slides. But what I'm going to do today is I want to make this as much a conversation as possible. So please interrupt, ask a question. Uh, as I look across the audience, we've got a broad spectrum of young farmers, established farmers, some academics and agribusiness people. So my goal is to plant some seeds that you can take back and talk with the producers that you are uh, working with. For those of you that don't know me, uh, Dan gave a little bit of the, my background. I'm a 25 year career employee of Farm Credit uh, with a whole lot of range of experience. The first 13 years I was a loan officer. The last 11 years, 10 or 11 years, I joined the consulting group, was uh, recruited by Don Rogers. He recruited four of us to replace him. That's what it took to, <laughs> took four of us to keep up with what he did. Um, and we've taken the, the consulting program to a different level. Day to day, I'm working with, last year I just wrote some notes to myself, I worked with approximately 50 operations, 49 of them were dairy, so I'm very biased with my examples, and one large timber operation. But what I'm going to pitch today, I'm doing with my timber operator as well. My range of cows, I worked with a 40 cow dairy up to two 3,000 cow dairies last year. So I've got that broad perspective. What I'm going to pitch today works for that 30 cow dairy, as well as the 3,000 cows. There's four success stories sitting in the room for one of the examples I want to do. I've asked permission to maybe call on them for one of the models. So you've got some real life examples of this financing uh, options. And I'm going to walk you through kind of a grassroots approach of what I do day to day if somebody asks me, how do I help me transfer the farm? And some of those hard questions that we ask so that at the end, my goal is that you're, you're going to walk away from this with that I've planted some seeds or at least you may know where to start. If somebody asks you as an agribusiness or academic, you know where to start, be it with a business consultant, your extension agent, or farm net. The concepts all work. So I want to start with, and as I looked at the proceedings that Danny had done, there's a lot of overlap with what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to have a different spin on it, and uh, what he did yesterday. As I look at, you know, where I talked about the title breakdown, transition, business ownership, and management. The management's the hard part. That's a lifelong process. It takes experience, it takes the right people, it takes communication, it takes constant, constant effort. The business ownership transfer I'm going to talk about today, that's in my eyes the easy part. You know, we can come up with a plan, it's that management part that is ongoing as a hard part. So we're going to talk about the easy part today and I'm going to gloss over a lot of the topics that each one of them has their own separate set of details that you can get into later. You see in the upper right hand corner, I've got this in steps. Because of my background in lending, I am extremely quick to tie it to money in and money out. Are we making money? Is the farm profitable today? And if it's not, can it become profitable? You know, has the next generation, this is the first question to ask your families at home, is has the next generation been exposed to the books. I got some thousand cow dairies that the 40 year old has no clue whether they're making money or not. The son or daughter. Some smaller dairies, the same thing. That exposure to the books. 
It's a chicken or the egg concept, and I really, really believe this, and this is one I'm constantly torn over, is do we need a business transfer plan, then become profitable? Or do we need profit, then the plan? Because as I do my day-to-day -day work and our consulting team does the day-to-day -day work, there's probably a combination of both of those going on. I fall in the latter category. I want to make sure you're making money first, then come up with a plan. But sometimes that's not always realistic just from a time standpoint. We've got to weave those both together at the same time. Step two. This is one of the on-farm exercises. You know, as I look through the proceedings, Danny had in there a lot. Put it in paper. A lot of the exercises I do on farm, we're putting it on paper. We're doing some things. This may not be fancy at times, but at least it's forcing the process. So the, first, the second step is what are the business risks that I'm really dealing with? Or in the, you know, as we do a SWOT analysis, the same thing as a, the threat. I'll have all the owners do, we'll, we'll set up a matrix. All the owners, key employees, maybe even some external people like myself, their loan officer, the nutritionist, you know, the equipment dealer, somebody that's intimately familiar with that business, write those down because everybody's going to have a little different take on what's going on in that farm. One of my producers said, ah, you swoop in and swoop out. And it hurt, but he was right. That's dangerous. Unless you're intimately familiar with the family and have done business on and on, if somebody come into your business for three hours and leave and only be there once and make some life recommendations, yeah, they might get the low-hanging fruit, but they may miss some very, very important things where, you know, you want to have multiple eyes on this to talk about that. So the threats one, the external factor, is, you know, helps determine the pace on how quickly I can do things. So what you know, what, and what I mean here is, you know, give me an example of a business risk and the associated pace. Give me some examples of some business risks out there. Anybody? Land availability. Land availability. It's not my number one one, but it is a risk. Weather is a risk, not my number one one. Labor's one. It's not my number one. Eh, all those. Still haven't heard it. It's the number one business risk, in my opinion. Nope. Getting closer. What? Nope. What'd you say? Health. Those, everything up to health, besides death, you have some control over. Yeah, weather, no, but I can do crop insurance. I can manage that risk. I can have carryover inventories. I can fix it with a checkbook. Maybe it may be ugly. But the one you can't predict is health. So as I look at the pace of tr business transfer, business risk, the, all those examples are absolutely true business risks as we're doing that SWOT analysis as a threat. But health, to me, is the number one business risk that we can't see coming. So if we're healthy, what do we have on our side? Time. And I'm going to circle back to that at the end. So that's a very, very important concept. And one of the big takeaways today, you know, if you only take a little bit away of what I'm saying, we got time. Sometimes. So what if I'm 80 years old, I've got a 60-year-old son, 35-year-old grandson, and haven't done anything? Time on my side? It's harder. Much harder. But we've got to start somewhere. And, you know, Extension, FarmNet, myself, we get those real life examples. Just, what do you, you know, you have to be realistic about the pace based on that age risk or lack of doing nothing. <laughs> Step three. This becomes a, another on-farm exercise that really takes some internal empathy, looking inward at your business. And I have the question, should we be farming together or not? A lot of families shouldn't farm together. They do it because it's a path of least resistance. 
it's just, I, it happened. But there's others where I've got sons and daughters coming back to the farm, totally different personalities, to say, I had one example and it hurt that I said I recommended this son not come back to the farm. He was already there, but not, not do anything just because of you could see it. You could absolutely see it from the outside. Five years later, it was separated. It was that, but having that internal leadership, so to speak, to answer that, can we farm successfully together? And that's a great exercise just because, you know, as I told uh, the families that I was sitting with this morning, I view my role as a safe place to vent, safe place to talk. That's all I bring to the table. I've done my job at the end of the day. I'm not smarter than anybody else, but sometimes it's that taking that 15 minutes to get up in the clouds, look at the business. John Lear brings that safe place to talk. And sometimes that safe place is to say, you know, that I pull the leadership out of these families. So that's a critical question, and it does two different paths. Do I farm together or do I farm separate? And there's options for either, but we've got to not just assume we're going to farm together. So when I do those exercises, and this is very similar to some of Danny's, is what's the business vision of each of the people involved? Could be three generations. You know, where do you see the business in two, five, and ten years? In terms of size, profit, debt load. I'll give the debt example. I'm dead, I'm dead adverse. I've been through that curve. I'm not going in there again. Got son that wants to go from 100 cows to 200 cows. He's going to leverage up the business, but I don't want to sign any more debt. Those are different visits that we have to sort through. Daily workload. I'm ready to slow down. I'm ready to get out of the way or no, I'm going to work, you know, die with my boots on. And that business structure. You know, what worked last time you did it? You know, with your dad, grandparents. Some of those models, you know, move forward because they had you know, historical success with. And then generation one versus generation two, is that business vision similar or different? If it's drastically different, I'm in that farm separate category. If they're kind of similar, yeah, we'll got slow growth over the next 10 years. We'll borrow some money if we have to. We'll buy the farm if we can. You know, we all get along. We want to do this together. If they're similar, is a whole nother set of rules. Every time we do some of this, you know, and I've, I've stolen some of this, but there's a lot of truth in there is where are we going with all this? What's the end game? You know, if I'm going to set something up, how am I going to end it? You know, it's like, where am I today? How am I going to exit? Is it feasible cash flow wise? And that, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you, you, any road will get you there. It's having that plan that I talked about earlier. Whole lot of pieces of the puzzle. A lot of pieces of the puzzle. I quickly go to the profitability piece because all of these others are dependent on making money. And I, as I work with a new producer, I view my role in two pieces. The monitoring piece and then the planning piece. When I first start getting my arms around an operation, there's a whole lot of monitoring. We've got several tools that will do budgets and things like that. And, you know, it takes a while. And then the planning is a little bit over here until you get the trust factor. And then over time, the monitoring becomes the profitability. We've got that well-oiled. We can monitor it. We did good. What are we going to change? And then the planning piece becomes much larger. So over the course of a 10-year period, we're chunking off pieces of these. We're intertwining these on an ongoing basis because if you choose to tackle all those today, none of them will get done. It's what's most important priority based on the time and the pace and the business risk and what do you want to accomplish in the future. So I'm going to take the example where we had, you know, we're going to farm separate because we had different visions, different personalities. And on here, I've got finance old equity. Because I'm going to circle back to that old equity piece with the same model. 
But if we're going to farm and finance and transfer the business, you really have, uh, other than passing away and running it through your estate, if you're going to do this while you're alive, you've got three options. Full market value sale, where we're going to sell everything for what it's appraised for. A bargain sale, where you're going to sell it, you know, we'll appraise it and sell it for something less. So you've got part sale, part gift. And then just an outright gift. I'm just going to give it all away. All of those are op options. This paragraph and the next five slides will give you a second takeaway from what we had before. Are the meat of what I do every single day. Um, and I may be a little unsettling what I'm going to show you, but it's a great reality check to say, have you set your business up to fail, or have you set your business up to succeed? So I'm going to get on my soapbox. My producers have heard this multiple times. They're probably sick of it by now. But as we do any of these, there's a balance between affordability of both generations are equally important. I can't bankrupt mom and dad for the benefit of the business, and I can't bankrupt the business for the benefit of mom and dad's retirement, or vice versa. There's got to be a balance somewhere. And as I put the pencil to the paper is, have you conditioned the business cash flow for this moment? And I'm going to define it is, in very simplistic terms, are you taking big draws or little draws out of this business? And then I do a, what I call a relabeling exercise. Where, you know, I'm taking... You know, thirty thousand dollars out of the business today as a draw. I'm just going to relabel it and call it principal and interest. What does it really mean, and how does that tie back to the size of my business? It's a great reality check. So I'm going to give you two examples. The first one is, in my opinion, a little draw from the business, and I'm taking thirty thousand dollars out. There's a whole lot of businesses taking thirty thousand out. They're just saying, oh, I'm reinvesting it in the business. Okay. What's the end game? What's the exit strategy? Eh, not talking about that. We're just putting back in the business because it's a great return. I hear that weekly. It's a great return. Okay. But what's the end game? How are you going to get that equity out? Well, I'm never going to take it out. Maybe, maybe not. But that $30,000 a year, if I relabel that, works out to $2,500 a month. $2,500 a month over a 20-year loan term at 4% interest is $412,000. Some parts of New York State, that's 100 acres. Not very much. So if my vision is I want to get some of my money out of this, and my net worth is a lot more than $412,000, and I'm taking $30,000, we may be setting up a shot to the cash flow sometime in the future versus an $80,000 draw, relabeling, 80,000, same scenario, works out to be 1.1. I'm pushing the cash flow because there's a lot more $1.1 million net worths out there than the 400,000, depending on the size. And I could probably count on two hands the consistent you know, dairies that are taking $80,000 out. I want big draws. Sometimes our credit shop gets a little uneasy when I say that, but I want big draws. Now, what's got to come first if I'm going to take big draws? Profitability. I can't take big draws and be losing money. That makes me unsettled. But, so it's that chicken or the egg. This one, it's earnings first, then big draws. If we don't have enough earnings to do big draws, then we have to have some growth in the business, some fixing of the business, some constant uh, improvement. So I'm going still in that, if I'm going to finance, we're going to farm separate, and it could be farm separate or just sell to the neighbor, uh, but if I sold on 175 cows, all my assets at once, that's cows, that's feed, that's equipment, that's real estate, that's 14500 based on our benchmark last year. That's $2.5 million. If I want every nickel out of that, and I do have dairies that want every nickel out of it. It's what I earned. It's, I'm entitled to it. Um, so how are we going to get that out? This is where I'm going to talk about the 
the financing a little bit. Who's the bank? Farmers make great, great farmers. They don't always make the best bankers. So the, is it a traditional lender or are you going to hold the paper? Those are very important questions to ask. The traditional lender could be the farm credits of the world, the commercial banks, the FSAs. You know, there's some grant programs out there. You know, so you've got those traditional lenders out there, but before you go to any of those as a source of capital, you need a plan. You know, is there going to be a down payment? Do I have any? Or a, you know, when every when I was in the lending shop, every June. I would get inevitably one or two or three requests from somebody that just graduated college that wanted to start farming. Not two nickels to rub together. And they're just, you know, and it leaves a bad taste in their mouth to say, the bank's just saying no. Wow, the banks are bad. Well, not really. The bank's got rules. You know, it's how do you spin that to say somebody, you know, 100% financing is unrealistic just doesn't work. I had a, tim a different timber operator throw up his hands and I'm selling it to his son. He held the paper, 100% finance. You could see it coming. It was done in six months. It just doesn't work. So I'm going to throw out some options. So the all at once is really tough. This is more common, the stepped approach. You know, that we're going to do, if we're going to try to get all the money out of the business, there's no gifting yet, it's the partial purchase they ask. So I start with the cows, then go to the equipment, then go to the real estate. Chunk this down so I can get some experience. I can build some down payment. It's more realistic than the first scenario. The next is a bargain sale. I see this more common with family members, is that I realize I can't get every nickel out of that net worth I built. I'm going to do a part sale, part gift. Tying it back to what my draws might have been to say, how realistic is that? You know, first question is, does the senior generation need or want all those dollars? They need them all, this doesn't work. You know, if they want them all, it doesn't work. But if they say, you know what, I realize I want my legacy is this business to continue, there's probably a high, high need for some partial gift. And that's a lot harder for unrelated owners. In fact, I don't see that hardly at all with unrelated owners. Sons and daughters, I see it very, very common. This is one. And again, who is the bank? Option, we got gifting. I could just give it away. The full gift, partial gift, or time gift. The time gift is the underutilized tool as you can do annual gifts. You know, in that $14,000 a year number, plus or minus, it changes. Uh, that just, you know, if we did that over the course of 10 years, $140,000. I did it with two sons or daughters, that's a quarter million dollars. We're softening the growth of this net worth is an option that, you know, as we weave into plans. And making sure uh, the big one is how do we document that with the IRS. So now I'm back to the farming together piece. And this is where I'm going to give you a real life example that has worked very, very well uh, for the dairy industry and works for high profit businesses. So if I've come to the conclusion or the family's come to the conclusion that we're going to, we have similar visions, we have balanced skill sets and personalities and balanced skill sets is I don't have all equipment guys and no cow guys and I don't have, you know, all cow people and no equipment or if I'm running a big crop farm or timber operation that we've got a balance. And if I don't, if I'm not balanced, maybe I need to hire for that. But if we're going to farm together, and they say, "How do I transfer the business?" and I've got similar uh, vision of where we're going, I'm quick to say, "Let's talk about a business entity of some sort." And there's a lot of sole proprietors that don't have anything. If we've got a business entity, we've got to talk about, you know, is it the right one or not? But I'm going to assume in my examples that we have no business entity yet. So the entity that I'm going to talk about deals with future growth, not the old equity. The old equity, you circle back to where I started on the farm separate, the sale, bargain sale, gift. The old equity, we still got to contend with that in that framework. So in this example, I'm going to talk about the future growth. 
You've got business entity types. There's a lot of partnerships out there, fair amount of corporations, and there's a whole lot of LLCs. And the reason is the partnership is flexible, it gives you no liability protection from each other included, or the outside world. The corporation is very inflexible, but does give you the liability protection. The limited liability company gives you the best of both worlds. We can be, yes, Danny. Do you use the best of both? I don't. The, some of our shop are more fluent in that, uh, but I don't. Western, it's a more of a Western New York. We see them out there more than uh, Central or Northern. Is, are we seeing many S corps versus LLCs? For the benefit of the group, can you delineate between S and C corp? Yes. Uh, not very well. <laughs> Go ahead. A, a S corp is essentially a corporation with the liability protection operating as a partnership. There's a flow through yeah. of income to the owners. They get taxed. There's no double taxation. You still get a K-1. And the C-Corp, the other side of that is it's all inside the C-Corp. It's flexible to get the money out. You've got to take it as a dividend or a wage, which gets taxed again. That's the double taxation piece. So you're seeing a buzz on the LLC, and there's a reason, because we can get the best of both worlds. LLC, and I bolded the first bullet, gives us some very broad flexibility. And I'm going to give you one of the examples where we're using that. Uh, with the IRS. So, you know, I put perfect structure with a question mark just because you've got on the right equity from generation and one and generation two. Generation two equity might be zero. But the, the pie essentially is we got big for mom and dad and not much for the junior generation coming in. Could be zero. But that's a fairly typical scenario. So we're going to assume an LLC taxes a partnership, just like Danny said with the, the S-Corp. There's a pass-through, similar taxation to what you've got now. But I'm going to get in the weeds as to there's two basic types of LLCs. We've got a capital interest where I said the same pattern. What I mean is with a capital interest with the same pattern is if mom and dad are a 95% owner and son or daughter are 5% owner, the growth and the profits are split the exact same way, 95-5. What I want to get into the weeds on is a profits interest, where there's a different pattern. Any time that the ownership pattern is different than how we're going to split profits and loss, you have a profits interest, whether you realize it or not. So that same mom and dad at 95, son or daughter at 5, if we're going to do something different, 90 or 10 on the profit side, you've got a profit center. So I'm going to show you an example. So it allows, the profit interest LLC allows me to split future growth. The profits are defined two ways. One is earnings and one is growth, net worth growth. If I'm going to do an example of how I can split them differently according to your operating agreement. That is a real big transfer point is we're not transferring it so to speak we're just putting it somewhere else and we're slowing the growth of the senior generation which may be a critical critical piece depending on the pace so if I got mom and dad or the senior generation at 95 percent a junior generation at five I'm going to use an example of that future growth what if we split it 50 50 future growth let's say the net worth of that business from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, after we set this up, went up $50,000. Son or daughter or the unrelated owner gained 25000 of that. I'm oversimplifying this, but the concept is there to say, you know, how do I get that, you know, instead of putting 50000 more on generation, senior generations balance sheet, we can split this any percentage we want. 50-50, 90-10. I like to split it based on management contribution, then I've got something really legitimate I can hang my hat on with the IRS to say, 
huh, some of this growth, instead of it all dumping on a senior generation balance sheet that I gotta get off later sometime, I can slow senior generation's growth by half, and I can reward that next generation for really contributing to the business. It's a great concept. This concept came more mainstream about 15 years ago. And it came from the dot-com world, where I've got the money, Danny's got the brains, so I'm 100% owner day one, he's 0% owner, but we're gonna split business growth and profits 50-50. It works extremely well in the dairy industry, where we have high net worth growth businesses, um, but not necessarily a lot of extra cash. Because this is a paper transaction, and it's also tax free. So it works extremely well as you look at the, what the dairy industry has done the last 25 years. Yes? Um, the yes and no, uh, because the junior generation's an owner. So the, there's two pieces to this growth piece. One is the true earnings of the business. If I'm going to split the earnings and I made this is net worth growth. Well, let's say the business made a hundred thousand dollars of profit. That profit's subject to self-employment tax. So that's the yes part of the answer. This piece is tax free, so that's the no part of the answer, so kinda. It just becomes a tax planning, one of those little bubbles too that we've gotta weave in there. What, John? It's tax free of the year, yes, it's tax delayed, because you gotta contend with it at some point. Is that just earned equity growth or is valuation growth split? I try very hard to make it earned. So this does, because that's one of the IRS questions going to say, you know, re, does this work well with real estate? Eh, that's a gray area, real gray area to say my land went from a thousand acre, an acre to four thousand an acre. We're splitting that growth. That's great. I like these work, and you're going to see in my next example the operating, the cows, equipment, the crops, the you know the operating portion of the business, and trying to keep value unit values is similar, so it's earned growth. Uh, is where this works because that's an IRS question. That's a dead on that why we do good fair market value balance sheets at the end of the year so we can answer that. Are you doing this, John, with shares in the LLC? Yes. I mean, well, yes, yeah. But they're not doing per cow or this, it's percentage of the business. So, so you're changing shares. I mean, well, we're doing changing percentages, which you could argue with shares. We call this the Young Tiger model. Was the one extreme that I had is I had a son-in-law and daughter, mom and dad over here. These two were just aggressive. They wanted to take this 100 cow dairy to 2,000 cows, and they did. But mom and dad, her parents, had all the equity. They let them, and they stepped back. Mom and dad, on my 50-50 split, they were probably 90% owner, and the kids were 10 we flip-flopped it. And it was based on management contribution. Mom and dad got 10% of that growth. Son and daughter, daughter and son-in-law got 90% of that growth going from 100 cows to 2,000 cows. And it was absolutely legitimate. And that's why we call it the young tiger. It's a get out of my way, because I'm gonna grow. I'm gonna grow, grow fast. This works is that if the senior generation doesn't want a gift, you're gonna earn that. And I've always hung my hat on that management con contribution to say, you're going to earn that future growth, and this is one way to do it. We talked about the example. Junior generation may have very little. They may start out at 0% the first year. They just got that, you know, that right out of school, and they're hungry. This works extremely well that way. You keep an eye on my time, Dan? Yeah. Okay. This only works if you're profitable and have got a history of equity growth. If you're unprofitable, I'm doing the tiptoeing around. 
you know, this I've shown all the bright sides of this model. If you're unprofitable, this works backwards. So the real downside is I come in at 0%. This works backwards for three years. Instead of positive equity, I got negative equity. And that's probably when I'm going to leave. That's a taxable transaction when you leave. And you got no money to pay the bill. That's an ugly situation. So you have to have that heart-to-heart -heart on there. It's a great tool for estate planning to slow the growth, that future growth of the senior generation, and speed up that. Talked about pace again. Split equity growth heavier towards senior or junior generation. I can dictate that to some extent. I do not like changing these percentages year to year. For view fair of the IRS saying we're playing games with taxability, but I'm not afraid. You know, we've got uh, ones that we're changing every five years or every three years of having a heart-to-heart. -heart. Did management change? Yes. The, the implement the, fi the, the old equity fixing it or the growth? No. They were at 95 to 5. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great question. Great question. There, and I, actually, I'm going to pull on some of the in the audience. With these, this is great to, for the junior generation who we'll go here. You know, they're eager to grow their equity through their day-to-day -day efforts and contributing capital. How do we account for that? How do they know that they went from a 0% to a 10% or whatever? There's an annual accounting. And this is one of the best planning pieces that's probably underutilized is you should be doing a fair market value balance sheet every at the end of the year. If you're not, this doesn't work. But I look forward in the summertime to meeting with the families, meeting with the uh, accountant who will do the math of this, where we're taking beginning equity minus the draws plus growth and split that to say, what did you actually get at the end of the year? And the young tigers have figured this out to say, they're hungry for that meeting. They want to know, did their efforts work? Emily, can I ask you, does your family look forward to that and pros and cons of that meeting, Brute? No? Lynn? Mark? Does he look forward to that number? You've got an unrelated partner in this model. Does he look forward to that meeting? The motivation, not just a job. Yes, Sheldon. Required by law, absolutely. But yep, yeah, they don't. But this, this we weave in there, and all of a sudden, it's a great way to have that annual LLC meeting. So yes. It accomplishes a bunch of things. But I, yes, George. That, that market value evaluation at the end of the year, I have always told my children, run your balance sheet on January 1st and see how much your bicycle decreased or whatever. Only one of my children really followed it. He's now my partner. But that is the most important it's your report card for the whole year. You can do it every month and all that stuff, but January 1st is our report card, and do we ever look forward to it, and hopefully it's positive. And I agree. If I looked at, you know, I don't run a farm business, but I do my own balance sheet, it's we're all in this room, whatever we're doing, we're working for wealth to do something with it, pass it to our kids, give it away, um, but that's that report card. That you know tells you did we have a good bicycle year or a poor bicycle year? Good example. 
But I find that, you know, that yes, no answer I gave and those annual meetings in the summer where they sit down with the accountant are a great motivating factor.